There you go. I believe we are live. This is my <laughs> first ever <clears throat> LinkedIn Live. And we're a few minutes late because I had a few tech difficulties, couldn't get my microphone to work um, and a few other things. But I'm really excited about this. I haven't, I've done YouTube Lives, I've done Facebook Lives, but I haven't done a LinkedIn Live before. So if you're joining us, um, welcome. I think this should, if I've got the tech right, be going out on YouTube and also into my Facebook group. So no pressure there, Kaz. <laughs> oh, anyway, let me just do some quick introductions. So this session is Thrive at Your Desk. It's some essential tips for freelancers with Kaz Hitchcock. Now, as I say, it's my first ever one. So let me have a little bit. Maybe you can give me a little bit of um, leeway if this all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> I'm sure it won't. Um, so Kaz, I'm just going to do a quick introduction and I really want to dive in and find out more about what it is you do because I'm, I find it fascinating and there's so much need for what you do right there. So Kaz is an anatomy and human movement expert specializing in fixing faulty movement patterns to alleviate chronic joint pain. Her own personal journey, paired with her extensive knowledge, inspired her to create a unique modality called the Gravity Technique. And for many years, Kaz was a yoga teacher, but was also frustrated with the level of knowledge that she had at the time to help her clients with various injuries that they'd come to her with. She embarked on a 10-year journey to dissect literally the body and learn about the fascinating world of fascia. fascia? I'm going to find out how to pronounce that in a moment. <laughs> and anatomy in motion. And she now teaches and coaches her fellow yoga and movement professionals, but also anyone really who's keen to learn um, and level up their skills so they can help their clients or themselves on a whole new level. So Kaz, very, very grateful to you for, for giving up a bit of your Friday morning to come and chat with me um, this morning about how we can thrive at the desk. Because I know as a, a freelancer, I spend way, way, way too much time like this, hunched over a microphone, <clears throat> staring at a screen. Tell me more about the gravity technique, um, how it came about and how it's different. We are different, <laughs> very much so. Um, yeah, I trained as a yoga teacher uh, a long time ago, 15 years, something like that. 2008, I graduated as a yoga teacher. But the problem was is um, no one ever came to me for the yoga class they all came through the door clutching something uh saying you know somebody told me you could help me uh, with this and i just found because you know i was in my early 20s then i just found that uh what i'd been taught this kind of bendy stretchy uh modality just wasn't being reflected through the students that were in front of me people in their sort of sort of 40s onwards, if you like, that were looking to improve their health and well-being. And um, yeah, it just it the, the two just didn't seem to match up for me. And I, I found that my anatomy knowledge was was lacking. I couldn't I couldn't support people as well as I wanted to. I have a natural aptitude for seeing body movement. We were talking about 40 movement patterns. You know, what even is a movement pattern? Um, and I just wanted to deep dive into that and from my own journey as well. So I had my first surgery when I was 12, my second surgery when I was 20 and my third when I was 23 for a congenital kidney issue. So I have whacking 11 inch scar that runs from my navel to my spine my, around my right side. And initially when I was younger, yoga helped with that. But as I, as I got older, but also as I had my daughter and you know there's other sort of life phases that we go through um i just found that i needed something more something more supportive something that was more body sympathetic and was sympathetic to my needs mm -hmm. so a lot of the time we we approach our exercise modality in that you know the body knows what it's doing and it will just balance itself out if we just push through and keep doing the same things as we have before and what I learned was that at a very early age, I'd laid down a healing movement pattern, which caused me to use everything but my core muscles. 
So whilst I was practicing yoga, I found that I got very stiff shoulders. I ended up with a frozen shoulder and some tennis elbow. And I didn't really understand why, because I was doing the yoga. But if you're running on a movement pattern that's been laid down for whatever reason, we have them for many different reasons. If we, the, the analogy I like to use is if you pick up the shopping to put it in the boot of your car, and that gives you a sharp pain through your back because you've twisted in a certain way. The brain notes that down and you won't move in that way ever again because it's noted it as, as something that, that is um, costly to the body, it's stressful to the body, it's caused pain to the body. So then you'll move through the shoulder or you'll move through the hip as a compensatory pattern. And what happens is we lay these down like layers of the onion over time. We are born with the original blueprint for movement um, and I said that in my reel that I put out earlier this week, you know, we're born with something that's laid down at embryo stage before we even come out of the womb and we're subjected to subject to gravity. So with, with that in mind, what the gravity technique seeks to do is to clear down some of those unhelpful movement patterns. We don't want to stop them from happening because the brain is designed to keep us safe. And some of those movement patterns are useful. The healing patterns that I'd laid down to uh, protect my side in the early days, of course, are useful because you need that while you're in a process of healing. The problem for me was 15 years later when I met my teacher, I was still show, still exhibiting those movement patterns and they would have, you know, left until I was 40. They would have been, you know, we can just sort of theorize on that, probably very degenerative to or destructive to the low spine discs because you can't go around not using your core muscles for the rest of your life. It would be bad. So, but it's an introduction. Uh, the gravity is very, we get very into the neuroscience of things because the brain always needs to be satisfied that we're safe. So we use gravity, the breath and the ground to move and to reintroduce the brain body connection. So we get the brain connecting back to a viable movement pattern that would be through, say, central core system. But we keep checking in with the brain to make sure that it feels safe. And if it's not in pain, and then we rebuild the trust connection between the brain and the body. Blimey, so, I'm saying I, I can, I'm glad you mentioned the neuroscience because I'm, I'm massively kind of interested in how we lay down patterns of thought mm -hmm. and how they create our belief systems and yes. I've always thought of it as a, a thinking behavior but actually what you're saying is that same so, sort of patterning has an impact on our physical behavior as well. Yeah and, and that's where the fascia research comes into it because the fascia is that kind of the, the undersung component of the body. We've got the bones and the muscles, but there's a cling film webbing that covers the muscles, the bones and everything. We're a very complex piece of fascia origami, if you like. Um, and what we first thought was just a packing material then turned out to be, um, if the muscles are your coffee, then your fascia is the mug. So that it's the container, but it's also the driver for movement. So the muscles provide the power, but the fascia provides the direction. And then in the most recent years, I mean, this stuff is really new. It's in the last two decades, we've really started to, to get more and more information. As our advances in uh, technology uh, leap forward, then we're able to see fascia in its truest form and then we're able to study it better because you know we need more we need more advanced techniques to be able to do that it's tricky stuff in its original form it's like egg whites so it's it's a slippery monkey it's quite difficult to get hold of quite literally but we now know it to be neurologically charged and we know that it reports back to the brain constantly back into the ancient part the thinky part of the brain so your your body is a reflection of your mind and your thoughts and your thoughts and your mind are a reflection of your body. Mm. It's a two way conversation that's happening all the time. But when we're not aware of that, then we start to run in, into trouble because when the, when the body's ruling the mind or the mind is ruling the body, I work with people that have had a cancer diagnosis and you can see in their body, the point where they were given that diagnosis. Now their treatment uh, and their surgery and their recovery may be all done, but they'll still be displaying 
patterns where they had that, you, you know, it is a traumatic experience to be told this diagnosis for many of us. And we can hold that in the tissues in the body. And we, we know that now to be to be true. So exactly that, as you say, what we think we become, and that is a physical level and as well as a, a mental level. Yeah, I mean, I know I, I've been told in the past, you know, when you're stressed or if you're carrying any kind of trauma, we tend to carry emotional trauma as a physical um, representation in the body. So how, at a practical level, what, what sort of things do you do with your clients to help them, what, what is it, realign the fascia or is it release the fascia? What, what is the, the terminology? We... We have great ideas as humans. <laughs> it mostly comes from the cortex at the front um, that, that we know what to do with the body. We get into the alignment and releasing things. And at TGT, we really like to follow the why. What I found in my own journey and what I found with my clients over the years is that your brain put that thing, whatever it is, tight hip, tight hip flexor or lifted shoulder, put that there for a reason. So whilst it's nice to try and realign things and it's nice to try and release things, it only really gives us temporary relief because we're not following the why down and low enough. And in the case of hip flexes, if we've got a grippy, we've got a grip at the hip, we want to know why, because if we release the hip flexor, does then the body just fall down like a house of cards? Is it holding something up? You know, we want to be a little bit more intelligent than that what's it there for but also if the brain doesn't feel that it's safe to let the hip flexor go because it contravenes one of the very strict rules that's running in the back of the bread back of the head one of those is don't hit the floor <laughs> don't fall over because you get eaten by the everything ends with being eaten by the saber-toothed tiger basically um it's a bit like choose your own adventure and there's <laughs> so many of them you end up getting eaten <laughs> So one of those very strict rules in the back of the head is, you know, don't fall over, don't damage yourself. And it doesn't matter how much pain you're in. Your body is, your brain is there to keep you safe. It's not there to keep you comfortable. So if the screaming tight hip flexors are keeping, or it thinks are keeping you upright, that's for the brain, that's a win. And because it makes, the, because the brain feels safe, because it's got these, you know, blocks in place that are holding you up, if you try to release that and take that out, your brain is not going to play ball with you. So we look to work with your body rather than against it. Why is it doing what it's doing? And generally, if somebody, a bit like the hip flexors, we call them Atlas holding up the rest of the world. If somebody's overworking and it's giving you pain, somebody else in the body isn't doing their job. So somebody is, is sat on the sofa with their cup of tea, not doing a lot generally <laughs> this is a sweeping generalization if the central core system as it is when we're in sitting at the desk if the central core system is in a little bit of a state of collapse which it does after a time of long periods of sitting something's got to stop you hitting the floor so it's going to be the muscles at the hip mm. does that make sense so we start it does, to look, yeah it's, yeah it's quite a physics -y sort of approach as well so it is fiercely logical um, it's just understanding how, you know, why things are happening the way that they are. And when we get to the root of that, then we can start to shift the body into a different arrangement. The muscles that aren't working so hard start to wake up. And then we get a natural, the release is a natural byproduct of that work. Yeah. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I, I've, you can't, I don't know if you can see it here. This is my walking treadmill which is not where it should be <laughs> because it's propped up against the side of the desk so I can get my chair under, which is a kind of farcical really, isn't it? Um, I do I do use it. But one thing I've found is I have a rise and fall desk and everybody yeah. kept saying, get a rise and fall desk. It's brilliant. Yes. So I have a, a rise and fall desk and I do alternate between sort of sitting, standing, sometimes I'll put the treadmill down, depending on what I'm doing, I'll walk on the treadmill. But actually I think because I've been using – a sit down desk for so long when I stand I actually feel in more pain so my body's yes. screaming at me to sit back down again um am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing with a standing desk 
So we're a little controversial over in the TGT camp. <laughs> there was, you know, we've been through a process. COVID, you know, the COVID times changed everything because we were working from home. And I saw more instances of, you know, stiff shoulders and uh, back pain than ever before because we were working at kitchen desk saw a really interesting arrangement where someone had salvaged a piece of worktop out of the garage and it was stood on some ikea plastic boxes um, and they had their makeup you know makeup uh, stool as their seed i mean this is or people on laptops on their sofas it's catastrophically bad but the so of course you know the answer is well change your position but if you're there's there's two things i want to touch on there do you know how to stand yeah, you know how. Well, well, the answer would naturally be yes, because I'm human and it should be obvious. But I'm guessing it it's probably obvious, no. But if you're standing I, I do arch with my back a bit, yeah. If you're standing with dropped arches and locked out knees, and the other and the other thing is, is that you're not wrong. <laughs> so nothing is ever bad or wrong. Um, there's just there's just movement. It just is. So and whether it's useful over time. And I think that's really important because we're so conditioned as to whether we're doing something right or wrong, um, you know, and, and sort of offering this It's from school age, isn't it? We do a thing and then we offer it up for external validation. And, uh, you know, that's that's not always useful. It's the question is, how do I feel? So we seek to reconnect you back to your body so that you can get that. For most of us, we need to significantly improve our kinesthetic awareness, which is where your joints are in space. The amount of people I work with, they don't even know that they lock their knees out. So I'm hypermobile and I've had to work very, very hard with the alignment of my elbows and my knees. But when I started with my teacher at 24, I had no idea. Five years, the, the five years previous to that, I'd been practicing quite a rigorous form of yoga, which involves lots and lots of the infamous downward dog. And I've been doing it with this inside out elbow. What we want to do is start to touch back in with the body and to start to notice how we feel when we're sitting and standing. But what's really important in what you just said is that the defining factor about what we're doing the activity that we're doing is looking at the computer. The fact that I'm sitting or standing is the secondary factor. But the first thing's first, I need to look at my screen. And this changes the dynamic for everything. So when we're looking at the screen, it takes the eye into sharp focus. So we have two ranges of vision. We've got sharp focus and fuzzy focus. And sharp focus is when we want to take in lots and lots of information very quickly. And the, the driver for that, again, because it's in the ancient brain, so this is stuff that, that came through with our evolution. Sharp focus is so that I can look up to the top of the hill. I'm in my village at this point, a long time ago. I want to look up to the top of the hill and I see someone coming. Is it Bev bringing me cake? It could be. But also it could be somebody that's going to come and burn my village down. So then it could be a threat. So in that case, I need lots of information very quickly so that I can make a decision about whether I need to go and put the kettle on or whether I need to mobilize myself and get out of there quick. Also, sharp focus is, you know, if there's a rustling in the bushes next to me and I look down, is it something that's going to be my dinner or am I going to be its dinner? So, again, lots of information and then I make a decision. And this changes the, the brain dynamic when I'm in fuzzy focus and I'm, I've got that lovely peripheral vision, we're going to do an exercise for this in a moment that, that helps, then um, the head goes naturally back into the gravity line and I've got this lovely broad periphery which switches off the stresses in the body. I, well, I think I know this is expanded awareness or hackalau. Is that the same, same concept here where you're kind of s s taking your focus around the outside so you can basically it it it, it t kicks in your your rest and digest rather than your fight or yeah. flight am i on the right yeah, lines here? absolutely it puts that? you into repose mode okay brilliant the problem that we have is that sharp focus is required for about 90 percent of our daily activity so if you think of every time you're taking in lots of information 
So us being on the screen today, every time I look at my phone, when I'm driving, usually if I'm walking the dog, if I have small children and I'm following them and I'm keeping an eye on them, keeping an eye on them, it's there in our language. But every time the eyes go into sharp focus, the head is naturally drawn forward. And when the head naturally draws forward, the tail naturally draw, uh, draws under. Because if we do this, and if we were doing this in standing, when you take the head forward, if you don't tuck the tail under, you're gonna fall on your face. So every time we're looking at the screen, every time the head goes forwards, your tail has to tuck under in order to support you. And you can feel this when you're in sitting, and it does this over time. We will just keep going and keep going. So it's really important that we understand that the weight of the head, and it is heavy, it's a good 12 to 14 pounds, which is nearly a stone in weight. So when it comes forward out of the gravity line, the spine and the pelvis and the rest of the body all have to mobilize themselves so that we, are, we don't face plant the screen and we don't fall on the floor. So when we're aware of that, then we start to reposition the head and then that helps us to sit up. So it's not just a case of, you know, I feel like I slump at the desk, I just sit up. Because actually that's a really heavy thing to do. Does that, does that help? It does, yeah. So so when you're saying it's not so much about the position you're sitting in, are you suggesting that we try regularly to get into fuzzy focus and out of yeah sharp so focus. one of the primary gravity techniques is sharp focus fuzzy focus so should we do this together oh go on then i wasn't expecting yeah, 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 yeah come on it's, it's show and tell we'll do it together okay so we'll put the thumbs out in front of you put my what out in front thumbs thumbs oh, out thumbs. In front. yeah and you're going to look at your thumbs <laughs> you have to go I... around the microphone <laughs> so if when you look at your thumbs if you look at the you know, the striations of the skin and, you know, your nails and all of that stuff. If you keep looking at those, and you can do this for yourself in, in your own practice, but if you keep looking at that and keep taking in more the information, the more information you take in, the further your eyes come forward, the head, further your head goes forward. You can feel that happening. Mm, so what yeah, we're going to do is we're going to look past the thumbs, we're going to turn the thumbs fuzzy, but we're going to keep them in our vision. And what we're going to do is going to walk our thumbs outwards. Now we've got the potential. You're going to take out all your microphones and your <laughs> and your walker. So we've I'm still focusing on my thumbs, keeping them in the in the fuzzy focus. But you're How going to far out them. do I go? As far You've as got I can potential see. Potential for 180 degrees. Oh, I'm going to have to turn slightly. Hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I disregarded. Um, treadmill is getting in the way so notice the point where the thumbs go out of the peripheral vision and then just let the eyes sink back let your head sink back and let your shoulders drop and you'll feel that there's a lot that needs to happen around the neck and the shoulders and then you get a bit more range and you can continue on your journey yeah just so it drops it it's does. like everything sort of just it does i don't know just like feels like a, a, a key fitting back into a lock so we feel the shoulder blades go together on the back yeah. of the body which gives length into the neck and then just allows the head to continue its journey going back 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 and this is a practice that we want to be doing because a measure of how how high your stress levels might be is determined in how close you can get to your 90 degree uh, range on one side would I still be able to see my thumb? absolutely thumbs stay in the vision all the time okay yeah I can yeah and what we feel is we, we have to create quite a lot of space into the the back of the head and the neck in order to just continue our journey and this has a direct effect so when we talk about fascia and the fact that we're a complex piece of fascia a complex piece of origami fascia what's happening in the back of your uh, at the base of your skull what's happening in your neck spine is reflected in your low spine and your pelvis so as the head comes back into the gravity line the tail untucks and the sit bones come down into your chair and there's a there's a definite movement there which helps us to sit up so i was just going to say i can feel strength. myself yeah i can feel even just 
now I've come back to sitting, I feel more upright, I feel more aligned. I do have a tendency to slump forward and put my hand, head on my hand. But yeah, that's that's incredible just from doing that. Yeah, just, just from doing that. <laughs> so is that, would you say that's more important than changing your up-down posture, standing, sitting? How often should we be doing that, do you think? So for fuzzy focus, I think a few times a day. So I have clients that set an alarm in their phone. Um, others, every time they go to make a cup of tea, they'll stand and do their fuzzy focus, sharp focus. The gravity techniques are designed to button into your day-to-day -day activities. So they're not a set of, because the uptake on prescription exercises is low. It's, mm. it's less than, I think it's somewhere around 15% now. So we get the sheet of exercises, we stick it on the fridge, and then they go under the category of, I did mean to. So we don't do it. So the, when I started to create the gravity techniques it's like well how do i get this into day-to-day -day life we can't stop sitting at the desk we can't stop standing at the desk because you know it makes the makes our world go around so with that in mind it's how do we how do we get you while you're while you're there how do you support yourself better and there's there's tricks that you can do with that interestingly something that i wanted to touch on was low back pain when we're sitting at the desk mm. I think the stat on that at the moment is 80% of the Western world now experiences low back pain at some point in their adult life. That is catastrophically high. We And again, we have to look at why. Um, and I think, study, you know, there was a study in 2013, made the New York Times headlines, says sitting is the new smoking. Yeah. Which is a bit mean because you can give up smoking. But if sitting at the desk pays your mortgage, you're not giving that up anytime soon. So how do we support you better while you're while you're doing what you're doing? So we started to get into some studies um, about low back pain and, and the driver behind it. So obviously the head coming forwards and the tail tucking under pulls the the low spine too long, which is why we have problems with the, the psoas um, and those sort of deep postural uh, muscles interestingly we measured one of the deep postural muscles it's called quadratus lumborum for those anatomy mm. anatomists out there for everyone I else it's a harry well potter before spell. and it's painful absolutely for everyone else it's a harry potter spell yeah so <laughs> <laughs> when we sit and the head is forwards and the tail is under quadratus lumborum or ql is too long when we stand up and the pelvis realigns itself or should do if it's not become a habit to always have it tucked under when we stand up and the pelvis realigns itself it takes seven minutes for ql to go back to its original length which is shorter and what we found in the the studies that we ran was it doesn't take seven minutes to get up and make a coffee it doesn't take seven minutes to get from your desk to the car to drive home and it doesn't take seven minutes for you to get from your car to the sofa so we're spending long periods of time with these um, primary postural muscles on the inside and the outside. The outer ones are QL. The inside one is the much maligned psoas. People have written songs and books and poems about the psoas. <laughs> but when we, in the fascia world, we want to look at the body as the complete whole. We can't individually isolate parts of it or manipulate parts of it, nor should we because everything is affected by and of itself. So it's a bit like when you throw the stone in the pond, you get ripples across the whole surface area, not just in one place. And it's the same with the body. So we have to look at, you know, how the head is affecting the pelvis and how the pelvis is affecting the feet. And then we work from the feet to the pelvis to the head again and, and look at where everything is in gravity because that ultimately um, affects how we feel. With QL taking seven minutes to, to go back to its original length, it's something to bear in mind so that we just take that break a little longer so that we do take the walk around the block at lunchtime rather than just going and, you know, we think the respite is sitting and reading a book for a moment or rest is to go and do something else. But if that something else is sitting, then it might not be, be useful. Is so is seven, is seven minutes kind of a sweet spot? If we're going to take a break and move around, should it be a minimum of seven minutes? Yeah, I, I recommend 10 minutes. Okay. 
to to let you you know do your fuzzy focus and your sharp focus i can't extol the virtues of walking more enough you know go out look at some trees hug a tree just do something else than yeah. be in this and i i'm you know i can preach this stuff all day long because i can sit and look at the computer like everyone else and look up and it's you know it's wednesday <laughs> i've lost yeah. three days yeah. i i spend um, hours what are the biggest ergonomic issues you see in sort of entrepreneurs and, and businesses? Because let's face it, when I was working, I'd go and do a seven hour day and then yes. I'd come home and do other things. Now yes. I work for myself. My seven hour day is normally a 12 or 13 hour day. Uh, yes. just, God knows how I got that one wrong. But yeah. are, there, are there particular ergonomic issues that you see particularly in uh business owners freelancers entrepreneurs. yeah because we're not set up right because you know we we all remember when we went to to corporate and you get this lovely you know the ergonomics hr person comes round and you have your desk and your chair and you know the tick boxes yeah, yeah, um, yeah. which you know will take you so far but we don't have that at home so like for me at the moment i'm sat at my kitchen um dining room table and whilst I'm happy working here, I have got a setup that supports me. But for a lot of us that have, you know, started working from home in 2020 and have stayed so, have you taken steps to make this a more permanent situation for yourself? So if a couple of main pointers for freelancers. You must be able to get your feet on the floor. And if you can't, I'm really going to show my, my age here, get some yellow pages under your feet. So something under your feet. If you can't push down with your big toes and, and hit something, because your big toes and the arch of your foot, and we'll come into your standing desk in a second, but the big toes and the arch of your foot have to be lifting because that lifts the pelvic diaphragm, it lifts the breathing diaphragm, and it lifts the uh, jaw diaphragm. So when your feet can't touch the floor, the only thing you've got is down. And I'm terrible because I, I like to sit with my legs tucked underneath me and all sorts of, you know, this sort of stuff going on, which for short periods is OK, but you don't want to be doing that all day long. So make sure that you can press with your feet. If you're pressing your feet into your surface and you can't get any upward lift, go and make a coffee or go and take a break or do something. So that's kind of that's your metric. If you're pressing with your big toes and you've got nothing happening up your spine, then go and do something else because you've run out. Of, you've run out of juice at that point. The other thing that I really recommend is a skinny cushion. So even for your desk chair, the tendency is, is that the pelvis tilts under and then the low spine goes too long. So your skinny cushion isn't a cushion for, for sitting your whole bottom on, it goes behind your sit bones. So if you pull your sit bones down into the ground, into the chair, let's do this together, pull your sit bones down into the chair, so imagine there's gravity buttons underneath them, you can feel the pelvis tilt forwards. Yeah, yeah. And the tail lifts and we get this nice upward lift. Now, like anything, and this this was my teacher decades ago when I did still work in corporate, and I said, how do I support myself better? You know, what do I do? And he said, would you do this for eight hours a day? And I said, no, of course I wouldn't. And he said, but you expect your spine to. And it changed the game. Like for me, that was such an eye opener because it's like I'm asking parts of my body to do something that I would never ask. You wouldn't expect yourself to stand on one leg for eight hours. You just wouldn't. But we do expect, we expect ourselves to sit at the desk for, like you say, 19 hours of the day. So gravity buttons under the sit bones help to help us to find the alignment of the pelvis. But then we give ourselves a hand by putting the skinny cushion under that gap that you can now feel behind the sit bones and under the sacrum. Does that make sense? It does. So really quite low down. So it you're is. not sitting on the cushion. The cushion is sort of pushing against the, the very yeah. low part of your back. It's and by just, skinny, how, how skinny are we talking? An inch this one I made inches? earlier. <laughs> ah. So nice skinny cushion, but it's going just on, just under your bottom, but behind your sit bones, because we want the brain every time the tail 
sinks down into that cushion, the cushion or the feel of the cushion just reminds the brain, oh, yes, we're sitting up. Oh, yes, right. we're sitting up. And if you've found that you and your cushion have just gone, guess what? It's time to have a break. <laughs> Everything yeah. comes back to having a break. So and, and that just helps to keep the pelvis in alignment for a little bit longer. So couple that with the feet, the big toes, the pelvis in alignment. You can feel this all gives you nice lift underneath the ribs. The ribs sink into the tummy. This is where the hunching over comes mm. from. So when we work with the bottom of the body or the lower parts of the body, big toes, and then the pelvic alignment, the ribs naturally lift up and out. And then your fuzzy focus, sharp focus will take care of everything else. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. So two really great tips there about having your feet on the floor, putting something underneath your feet if they don't reach. And, yeah. and tilting with the with the skinny cushion. If there were a couple of things, maybe two or three things you would suggest we stop doing, what might they be? I haven't primed you for this either. So I'm No, I'm you haven't. I'm just okay. hang on, I'm rolling oh. through the roller decks in the back of my head. <laughs> things that we should stop doing. Things. Being so bloody hard on ourselves. Okay. It's definitely one of the things I would I would recommend. And I'm gonna just take that medicine for myself as well. <laughs> um set a timer in your phone and stick to it it's so easy to get into that i'll just do one more thing as freelancers we all have that kind that that little bit of anxiety that we need to just do one more thing that that post can't wait that you know the the thing that we're creating that needs to be get, got out there or that, you know, twiddle in the platform at the back end or whatever it is. You know, we all have lengthy to-do lists. So, and, and it's very easy to get into that kind of the carrot on the stick, just do one more thing, just do one mm -hmm. more thing. And if that's you, set a timer and stick to it. The EU, you know, when we were a part of the EU, which is, you know, because I was in corporate a long time ago, EU directive in 2001, something like that, was 40, 45, no, 50 minutes of the hour was for working and 10 minutes off. Now, I don't know about you, but my boss was never going to tolerate that. I'm on my, my boss doesn't right now. My boss will not tolerate that. <laughs> and I am and the boss. Exactly. So how is your, you know, how is your boss treating you? So <laughs> with, you know, with that in mind, no, we don't have to take 10 minutes out of every hour, but we do have to give ourselves a break. Do that walk at lunchtime. You know, make it a non-negotiable, just like you make other things in your life a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. You sit at the desk because it's a non-negotiable and make your self-care the same. The other thing that's really important, if your body is your best friend, and it is because you guys are together until your final day, how are you treating your best friend? How's your relationship? Are you talking to each other? Is it just a stand up EastEnders row that's going on between the two of you? Are you ignoring each other? You know, are you pushing and pulling your best friend around? And to really get into that relationship and how can you support each other? Because if your body is, is happy, your productivity, your focus, everything else is a, is a natural byproduct of that. But if your body's in pain, it is seriously distracting to your brain. A stressed brain can't take on new things. And if it's being bombarded with pain signals, we cannot work efficiently. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. So, yeah, stop, stop beating yourself. You're not in a... <laughs> You know, you're not in a space where we have the luxury. Freelancing is a luxury place to be because, like you say, you are the boss. Mm. You set the rules. We don't have to adhere to somebody else's office rules. So we can use that to our advantage and be a little kinder to each to ourselves. Do you know, so, I'm so guilty of, of not treating my body as my best friend. Yeah. And, and I think... We forget sometimes because I guess because there's postural issues, it's not like you, you stub your toe, you get an instant reaction and you get that instant pain. It doesn't happen immediately, does it? It comes over time. So I think for me, I I I know what I should be doing, but because I'm not getting instant feedback that this is damaging me, 
it's the, the the fiddling around with you know the website in the background or just another bit of time on Canva or you know our our new best friend Chat GPT. That that's it feels more immediate. The feedback that I get from doing that feels more immediate and more rewarding. Absolutely. And I don't know, you know, I really do struggle. I I need you, Kaz. I do struggle to to prioritize the 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 vessel that that you know that this is the vessel that runs my business and I don't you know I give I would give my car better priority than I give my own my own vehicle yeah I think it's it's a really important thing for us to to acknowledge is that if you don't stop your body will stop you there is a fail safe circuit breaker inbuilt within us that we can't just keep driving the car with the squeaky wheel at some point it will stop you which I learned to my detriment in 2018 when I spent nine months in bed with, you know, a scar tissue issue, which is like like fibromyalgia. But all it was was a stress response mm. from just pushing too hard. I was working too many hours, trying to juggle all the things. And I, I'd had warning shots across the bow from my body. I'd had painful bits in my body previously. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And in the end, your body just doesn't tolerate it. There is a significant shift at age 40, particularly for women, where as the hormones start to shift and we start to change gear as we go into that mid stage of life. You know, I, I hear this from menopausal women all the time. You know, they they suddenly find that they just can't tolerate other people's shit. And we start speaking our boundaries. Your body is exactly the same. It gets to a point where it's just not going to tolerate the things that you were doing in your in your younger years. The other thing is, is that, like you say, these things do build up over time. Nobody woke up at 80 years old with a dowager's hump, you know, this, this slumped over. This stuff starts in our 20s and 30s with these minuscule movements forward uh, with the head and then this movement pattern that suddenly becomes habit. We have proprioception, which is an awareness of our body, of where it is in space. And proprioception is... Um, can be changed by habit. So a little bit like you might find it a bit revealing with the sharp focus, fuzzy focus, that when we actually get to 180 degrees and the head does come back into the gravity line, it now feels like the head's gone all the way back here somewhere. And that's because the proprioception is skewed. When you look in the bathroom mirror, you find that actually your head's nearly straight. And then you're like, well, that doesn't feel straight. Um, and that's because the proprioception has shifted. So if this goes on over time and this feels straight and this feels straight and this feels straight and we keep laying that down as as well, we keep normalizing it, then eventually we get to 75, 80 and we are we, now we've got a movement pattern or a body shape pattern that, that is not serving us at all. But this stuff happens over over long periods of time. Is it all reversible? Or is it ever too late to to start? My oldest client is 94. Wow. <laughs> you, ha you have, and I think this is the most important thing that we all have to acknowledge, you have a highly intelligent self-healing body that is built to support you for the whole length of your life. We all get 100 years there or thereabouts. It's how we choose to live it. Some of us a little bit less, some of us a little bit more, but we all have a choice on on how we live that and interestingly somebody said and i've heard this a lot but you know someone said it just a few weeks ago oh we're living longer than we ever have but also our studies show that our quality of life is poorer than it's ever been so from the age of 60 onwards people's pain levels are, are being recorded at such levels that it's debilitating it's life limiting mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm not getting to 60 when I've got another 30 years possibly to run with the wheels falling off it. I want to be off down the pier eating the chips and the ice cream looking at the sea. That's just, <laughs> that's just my thing. Everybody else I can see out of a flask at the side of the motor. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, everybody's, everybody's outcome is different. So I'm assuming from what you're saying that you don't buy into the idea that aches and pains are a natural 
side you know side effect of getting older I guess you're saying you know it doesn't have to be and and the body's not designed to be naturally achy and and creaky as we get absolutely older absolutely not and you know this is a this is a naughty narrative this is a naughty narrative that we've been sold into so you know if you if you just bring into your mind you know somebody who's 85 and just bring that into your mind for a second and just notice that how that person looks and how they're standing in their body shape this is an image that you've been fed your whole life you know as soon as somebody's old what have they got oh they've got a walking stick or they've got a mobility scooter or whatever it is and there's a couple of a couple of aspects to this one it's something that we're just conditioned there are some we, we won't get into that but there are some huge marketing juggernauts running in the world that want that need us to buy their products whether you rub a gel on it or whether you take pills for it or whether you've got some other you know gadgety things that are going to help you with your help you with your pain if we're not following the why and looking into that what's happening in my body pain is not something that we need to kill it's in our language painkillers it's not something that is bad or wrong and we need to make go away we have to change our mindset on this pain is your body calling for your attention it's telling you that you something needs to change because it's one of the languages that your body uses we have interoception and this is something that we work in in the gravity technique a lot in developing our interoception. Most of us are running on a real basic level interoception. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm cold, I'm hot, that's it. I'm sleepy. And that, that's real kind of base level stuff because actually your interoception tells you so much more than that when you start to touch in with how do I feel, which is another one of our foundational gravity techniques, how do I feel? And we continue asking the question until the thinky mind at the front, which processes our environment. We say, how do I feel? Well, I feel great because I chatted with Bev this morning. Or I feel terrible because I haven't had my coffee yet. Mm. And somebody cut me up at the roundabout. But that's all external environment. And it's not our fault because we're not taught this stuff. If we keep asking the question, how do I feel? Eventually the body responds and it has a language. We can hear it. So we get a true account of what's going on for us. And then what the gravity technique seeks to do is give you a toolkit and an education piece around how your body actually works. And then some gravity techniques or some movements that can support you to shift whatever's going on. So if your knee is, is you know, really talking to you, let's call it that, then maybe something's wrong in the gate. So the foot isn't connecting with the floor properly. It might be a pair of trainers. So I had terrible knee pain that came out of nowhere and it just coincided, sadly, because the trainers were beautiful and I was quite cross, <laughs> but it corresponded with this, you know, the new pair of trainers. And this, so all it turned out was the soles were too squashy. I mean, they felt beautiful, mm. but they were these lovely squashy soles. And because I'm hypermobile, my knee was destabilizing and the sharp pain in the side of my knee was acute. It appeared out of nowhere took the trainers off, changed back into something else, you know, that I had from before and the pain went away. So it's a call for your attention to shift something or change something. And when we understand how the body works and how movement works, how movement dynamics work, then we can do that for ourselves. And that's empowering. It allows us to take responsibility for our health and well-being. We don't always have to be taking the painkillers. I love this. This is so, so useful and so helpful. Kaz, how can people find you to, to work with you or find more about the gravity technique? Um, so I'm an omnipresent gravity technique. <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn. I have a little YouTube channel as well, which has got more sort of tips and techniques that we've got here. Currently running a free class. So if you want to come in and join me in the gravity technique classes, which is, you know, a place where we just explore movement and reconnection, then just pop me a pop me a message over at hello at gravitytechnique.com. Um, and I can send you all the details. You do not have to be in pain. If you've got if you've got a squeaky wheel, the proverbial squeaky wheel, don't wait until your wheel, wheel falls off. Or if your wheel has fallen off and you're not sure what to do, I know I've tried everything. 
over the years with my scar, you know, to manage my scar tissue well. So, you know, all your acupunctures and all of these different things. And I've taken what I need and left what I don't need. But also I see a lot of people when we've tried the physio and we've tried the osteo and we've tried the chiro and, you know, and if it's, if that's you, if you're getting to the end of the road with things and you need a different approach, then come and work with me one-to-one. I've got three spots in November at the moment for one-to-ones. Um, so again, just pop me a message over at hello at Gravity Technique and it'll be great to great to chat because, yeah, we need to change the narrative around it, particularly for menopause, I find, you know, this, this menopausal niggles and nags might just be your body asking you to slow down. Yeah, take, take a <laughs> moment to give it some attention. Yeah. Um, that That's absolutely brilliant, Kirst. Thank you so much for giving me an hour of your time. And I, I hopefully you anybody much. watching this, either now or on replay, I'm sure they'll have got loads of value out of it. I'm sat here with my hand in the lower part of my back. <laughs> being my, my hand is being my skinny cushion. And, you know, yeah. it, it is it is making a difference. I feel like my shoulders are more back. My head feels more upright. It, it's like I'm conscious that I'm feeling more comfortable. And I think I get unconsciously slumped. I don't even realize I'm slumping. So, yeah. so valuable, Kaz. Thank you so much. You uh, so when do, when does your free program start? It's running right now. So with TGT, although I've taught for... 20 years now tgt is two next week which is really exciting wow brilliant um, so yeah so so as my birth for my birthday you know i wanted to open the open the saturday class up for for people to come and just just have a try um it is challenging it's not for everybody we won't beat you into submission but connecting with yourself on a deep level is you know, it's not for the faint hearted. You've got to want to go a little bit like you do with your coaching, Bev. You've got to want to go in there and do a little bit of work. So, but it's lots of fun along the way. And we laugh a lot because, you know, what else can you do really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant yeah. and let me know try out your fuzzy focus and your skinny cushion and let me know because we're i'm collecting data all the time like i say i'm, I'm always involved in research projects and bits and pieces so you know try it out if it works for you great if it's not working for you let me know <laughs> Kaz, um, also one thing i want to, to say yeah. which we haven't really touched on we've talked a lot about how you can help individuals and the great, great tips for, for my audience in terms of those that are in business for themselves. Mm. But you also, you train people to deliver the gravity technique. Is that right? I do. I teach teachers. Yeah. So generally it's movement teachers who again have got to a point of, of you know, the, the cookie cutter approach to exercises so for me, I trained in yoga and I had all the yoga postures, but it was this kind of cookie cutter, one size fits all exercise. So I tend to work a lot with movement teachers who have just run out of road a little bit with their modality and are looking for something that, that serves their clients at a, at a higher level. The other thing is, is that as movement teachers, our classes are changing. So once upon a time, people just used to come in for an exercise class but the rate of people coming in with um, specific needs or pain issues or post-surgery, post-injury, and, and, you know, they've kind of been told by their healthcare professional, right, you know, you've had this thing done, now it's time to get back to Pilates or now it's time to get back to a yoga class. Um, you know, teachers, I feel that teachers need to be educated to a higher level in anatomy and physiology, certainly fascial anatomy, which changes the movement game completely. But if you are seeing those people coming through your door into your classes, then, and I felt very out of my depth at one point. Um, I had a few people in my class, one of them kept telling me that she had persistent knee pain. I didn't know why, she was asking me questions and I just felt really disempowered. And, and I felt that I was letting her down because, you know, this is what we do as, as, you know, movement teachers. We want to know everything we want, and we come in because we want to help people. Of course we do. So this is just kind of TGT is a formidable string in your bow with with regards to looking after people with needs in your um, in your classes and how to make your classes safer for people. 
because it doesn't matter how much you tell students and this is just for our just for us between the the movement teachers but it doesn't matter how much you tell people not to do something they're still going to do it i know i do because we can <laughs> our biggest competitor is ourselves yeah. So yeah there's uh there's you know the person next to me on the mats doing that i will do that too so how do we how do we safeguard our students and and just work at that slightly slightly higher level and like i say being fashionably informed whether you're a teacher or just you know everyday person once you know how this stuff works it changes the game it doesn't matter what your modality is whether it is that you love to teach or play tennis or whether you practice and teach yoga it's the same thing or just from sitting at the desk a little bit of this knowledge helps you to support your body better particularly as it moves into the second and third stages of life certainly in the third stage of life yeah. We have to be moving to, for the body that we have, not for the body we 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 want. Secretly, yeah. we think we we should have. Because I don't know about you, but I'm still 27 in my head. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The body definitely doesn't agree with that. That's why I need you so much. Uh, final question before we go: yeah. Give me a, a, a yay or a nay on investing in a, a, a rise and fall desk. As long as you know how to stand properly, yes once you understand how posture works and where where you want to be in the gravity line and what the gravity line feels like then you can sit and stand more efficiently all day long do we need to be changing our posture throughout the day yes we do absolutely but just the the issue that i found with the standing desks was that too many people were standing with flat feet locked out knees and the head still coming forwards and when we're not aware of those patterns running in the background it doesn't matter if you're sitting or standing because the posture is poor. So we, yes, yes, we need to change from sitting to standing, but we also want to be doing it efficiently. Great stuff. Kaz, thanks so much. It was an awesome <laughs> question. It's been brilliant to chat to you. Thanks again for giving up your time. I hope Thank people have so enjoyed much. it and found it useful. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be back doing more lives now that I can see that the tech works, which is always a bonus. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening.